I'm going to go quickly now to the book of Genesis chapter 48, 9 through 14. And I want to talk to you just a little bit uh, out of the Word of God. Uh, we'll go down to 14 and then we'll jump to 17 and pick up there. And Joseph said unto his father, they are my sons whom God had given me in this place. And he said, bring them, I pray thee unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see, and he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God has showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees. Listen carefully. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God, make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. He set him before Manasseh, and Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. But God shall be with you and bring you again into the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. And Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. I want to talk about out of order or when God gets out of order. Holy Spirit, help me. Can't do anything without you. I desperately need you. As a heart panteth at the water brook, so pant I after thee, O oh God. I need you. Help me to deliver the word of God to the people of God with clarity and nimbleness of thought that I might be endowed with the riches of grace to expound upon that which is not even discernible. I believe you, and I thank you, and I expect you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen. Without a lot of pomp and circumstance, I am going to just baptize you, immerse you into the moment of this text. It is my intention to snatch you out of your bed or your car or your living room or your dining room and drop you down thousands of years ago into a system and a time that this text bespeaks and contemporize it to the degree that you will understand that while they are ancient in comparison to the times that we live in today, they are no less human than we are. This is a story, the significance of this moment of which the family has united both physically and emotionally. Their reunion was timely and critical. Jacob, his sons, and the wives and family have gone to Egypt to escape a famine. This is not a field trip. This is not a vacation. This is a desperate move because, oddly enough, 
The promised land has gone dry and Egypt is fertile. Later we will see the reverse and they will escape Egypt to go back to the fruitfulness of what is now barren. I take a moment to say that because God has a way of switching up the story. The first can be last and the last can be first. And you can meet somebody at this chapter in your life, Egypt is a blessing and later on Egypt is a curse. That's why you ought not get too attached to things, nor people, nor times, nor stages, because stories have a way of switching around. But right now, Egypt is the place of fruitfulness and blessing, and the, the promised land is barren and dry and distraught, and Jacob and his sons have had to flee with their wives and their children and come to Egypt not knowing that this was all a setup. Sometimes the famine is what drives you into the purpose and the plan of God. Don't always pray against the famine because the famine is often God's GPS system that reroutes you from what you plan to work into what God has already set up for you. The process was arduous and multi-layered to accomplish this reunion. Reconnections do not negate the loss of time. They are finally coming back together, but they have, they have lost something that is not redeemable. They have lost time. The last time Joseph saw Jacob, he was a young man, strong and virile, standing in might and power, killing animals, pursuing his prey, controlling his land. But now Jacob is old and feeble. But Joseph is nonetheless glad to have him back. The remnants of his father are better than no father at all. <laughs> Time has passed, and Joseph is trying to catch up on something that he lost. You see, you know the story how Joseph has told his brothers that uh, as a child that he was going to rule, that they were going to bow, and jealousy set in, and they lied on him, and they mistreated him, and they beguiled him, and they sold him over to the Midianites, and the Midianites bought him for 20 pieces of silver and carried him to Potiphar's house. You know the story. This and all the complications of the story and how he had to flee from there and ended up locked up in the prison. And there in the prison, he stayed a while. And all of that time, a lot has happened. Jacob's hair has turned white, and Joseph didn't see it. Joseph has turned into a young, strong man, and Jacob didn't see it. The affinity between Jacob and Joseph is multi-generational. It did not just start with Joseph, for Joseph is the love child between Jacob and Rachel. The love that he had for Joseph's mother was so encompassing that he worked seven years to get her hand only to get Leah's hand and said, I'll work seven more to get that woman. That's love. After 14 years of hard labor, he, he marries the love of his life. There will never be another love like the love he had for Rachel. And Joseph is the love child. He was born in love. He was, their relationship was consummated in love. He was procreated in love. He emerged in love. He was Jacob's son. So you understand how Jacob's heart broke when his brothers came in and told him that his beloved child was dead. All of these years have passed by and he has had to live not only with the loss of Joseph, but the grief of Joseph. He said, you've brought my head down low and made it turn white with grief. And even when he tries to reconnect and, 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 and tries to build his life, he does it with the heavy weight of Joseph passing away. And God, as he often does, is rehabilitating the dysfunction of this family and he's bringing them back together again and they're reconnecting the brothers who betrayed him are realigning with him and God is bringing things into order and he's bringing things into alignment. And when we step into the page of the text, the old man is telling his beloved son that his mama is dead. He says, son, I lost your mother. I lost her on the way to Africa. 
giving birth to Benjamin. She's, she's gone. She's gone. And I buried her along on the side of the road headed for Ephrata, which incidentally would later be called Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. And she died on the way to Ephrata, just like Israel died on the way to believing that Christ was the Son of God. Rachel's grave is somewhere on the side of the road. And Joseph has lost his mother. And there's nothing he can do about it. He has lost years and years of relationship with his father. He has spent years and years first in Potiphar's house, nothing that was his own, taking care of things that was not his, managing things that were not his, only to be tossed out and then thrown into prison. And there he is running the prison, but he's not free. His life has been a series of contradictions that never would have happened if it had not been for his brother. It never would have happened, but it, but, but it is, it is what it is. Finally, toward the end of his father's life, this is a moment of reconciliation, and it is absolutely amazing because Jacob is here. His father is here. Israel is here. Israel has come to Egypt. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Joseph is so glad to have somebody from home who embraced his faith and his culture and his food and his dance and his style. That's not to beguile the Egyptians, but the, the Egyptians could not recreate the sound of the timbrels and the dance of the Hebrews. They could not do it. The Egyptians could not recreate the food and the style and the customs or the religiosity of the Hebrews. The Egyptians could not replace his father, though old and wilted and tattered and torn. He was still daddy and daddy's, daddy's about to leave. And there's something about the final hours and years of your life that make them sweeter, like nectar, like molasses, like syrup. It comes, it comes sweeter, more valued, more appreciated because you've got less time. And Joseph has gotten his two sons that he has created through being married to an Egyptian woman and he brings, he brings them in and he holds them between his knees so grateful that he finally gets the chance for them to experience his heritage because these boys have grown up knowing only the customs of their mother's side of the family. And yet it's their father's side of the family that defines them. This is a patriarchal society, but their father has lived his life as an orphan, disconnected from the common wealth of Israel. The real wealth of Israel is embodied in Jacob whose name is changed to Israel. And Joseph now takes his two sons in between his knees and says, that's Popo. That's your grandfather. That's my father. Now, this is the trilogy because from the old man's perspective, he scarce thought that he would ever see Joseph again. And not only does he get to see Joseph, he gets to see Joseph's sons, his grandsons. So important that they are the only grandsons to which Jacob lays his hands and confers a patriarchal blessing. A continued continuity of love that passes from generation to generation. I loved your mama, I loved you, I loved your sons. I loved your mama, I loved you, I loved your sons. I loved your mama, I loved you, I loved your sons. I see your mama's eyes in those boys. I see you, I see her in you. I love her in you. I loved your mama, I loved your son, my son. I loved his sons. This is an amazing Reconciliation. It is proof positive that God will restore unto you that which the canker worms and the locusts and the palmer worms ate up. He has brought them back together again. They've had their dysfunctions, they've had their problems, they've had their strife, they've had their confusion, the lies and the, and the malice and the hatred. And they could have been bitter, but they chose to be better than to be bitter. And they have come back together again for this sacred moment. You just stepped in the room 
of a moment that is so momentous that I failed to be able to articulate with, with, any, with any aptitude the, the, the massiveness of this moment. This is the moment that the old man gets to see the future in the eyes of his two grandchildren peering back at him through the legs of his beloved son Joseph who is now a full grown man. And not only a man, he is the prince of Egypt. He is the prince of Egypt. He is dressed in garments that do not bespeak his heritage, his customs, or where he came from. He is dressed like one of them, but he thinks like one of us. He is familiar with all of them. He is positioned with all of them, but he is kin to all of us. Joseph is complex because he is Egyptian enough to be a part of the royalty, but he is Hebrew enough to ache for his family so bad that when he saw his brothers, the one who lied on him and betrayed him, he, he wept and hid his tears from them because he, you can have everything, but if you don't have that family, you have lost a lot. This is a great moment of alignment, of connectivity. They're coming back together. Things are finally coming in order. They're amazing. They're amazing. And then he takes his sons and he begins to maneuver them in such a way. He takes Manasseh in his left hand and he maneuvers him. He guides him skillfully, the Bible said, wittingly to, to, toward his father's right hand. And Ephraim, he pushes with his right hand toward his father's left hand so that the old man would not get confused when he gets ready to lay hands on them. And then something strange happens. Something disruptive happens. Something chaotic happens. The, 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 the order is broken. Everything else in the story has come to order down to this one point. And then when it gets to this one point, there's never been a rift between Joseph and Jacob. There's never been a disagreement. There's never been an argument. There's never been a hardship. There's never been a complaint. There's never been an issue. For the first time in history, as he is dying, no less, Joseph is displeased because he thinks his father has it wrong. Now we know that order is important to God. Just set that aside. We know that order is important to God. For God has taught us, let all things be done decently and in order. We are clear that order is important to God. He is a God of order. He said, I am not the author of confusion. We know that order, is important to God. The first thing he did when God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void, the first thing he did was establish order. Let there be light and there was light. Let the firmament above the waters be separated from the firmaments that were beneath the water. All of that is God bringing things into order. Bring forth, bring forth. Bring forth the whole creation is God bringing things into order. He didn't even create man until he had everything in order because God is a God of order and protocol. We know that God is a God of order because when the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon's temple, when she saw the order of his men and the excellency of his service, there was no breath left in her. God is a God of order. And yet in this moment, we see something that is kind of confusing because by all rights, Manasseh should have the blessing. He is the older brother. If anybody's gonna get the blessing, Manasseh should have the blessing. And Joseph wanted Manasseh to have the blessing. And yet Jacob, now called Israel, decides to lay his hands not on Manasseh. He gives him his left hand, but his right hand he puts on Ephraim. And Joseph says, you must be confused, old man. You have put the right hand on the wrong son. What do you do when God blesses somebody you didn't intend? What do you do when God uses somebody that you don't like? What do you do when God raises up somebody you had your foot on? What do you do when the tail becomes the head and the last becomes first? What do you do when God gets out of order? Out of order. Out of order indeed. 
Is it possible that God can get out of order when he made the order in the first place? How can God who made the order get out of order as if the order were greater than the one that created him? God can't really get out of order because he created the order. He can change the order. He is God over the order. But for human purposes, indulge me in my folly because now God is using Jacob to get out of the order that normally would be conveyed from generation to generation. And the reason I present it to you this morning to share it in this, in this way, this unorthodoxy that we see happening in this sacred moment, this secret moment, this birthing place, this fertile place, the reason I bring it to you is that God told me to tell you that if he has to get out of order, he's still going to bless you. If he has to break the sequence, he's still going to bless you. If he has to bless you out of season, he's still going to bless you. If you haven't been set up, he's still going to bless you. There. Some Sometimes God is willing to get out of order to get you what you need when you need it, like you need it, and shock the people who tried to politicize and move and organize and ostracize and manipulate the system. When God gets ready to bless you, I don't care who they're pushing forward, God will raise up you. When God gets ready to use you, I don't care who they think is next, God will bring it to pass. And God told me to tell you that he's getting ready to change things up. He's getting ready to switch things up. He's getting ready to cross out old systems and structures and God is about to get out of order to get you what you need when you need it because it didn't look like you were going to get it but you are chosen. Slap somebody and holler, I'm chosen. <laughs> I'm chosen. I'm chosen. You don't have to like me because I'm chosen. You don't have to prefer me because I'm chosen. You don't have to want me because I'm chosen. You don't have to accept me because I'm chosen. What God has for me it is for me what God has for me. It is for me. I may not have any money, but it's for me. I may not have a degree, but it's for me. I may not have the benefit of the board, but it's for me. I may not have the support of the committee, but it's for me. What God has for me. And if he has to stir things up, and if he has to scramble things, and if he has to mix things up, God is getting ready to get out of order to bless you. The church doesn't want it, the people don't like it, the community doesn't like it, but God said, I swear I'm gonna bless you. You weren't set up for it, you weren't next in line, you don't have the credentials, you haven't been qualified, but I am going to bless you. I don't know who I'm talking to, but the stone that the builders rejected is gonna be the chief cornerstone and look at look 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 the old man the old man is so old and so feeble that he can scarcely see and still he's strong enough to resist the hands of his son trying to reverse the order his eyes are weak, but his hands are strong. And the old man said, I know what I'm doing. And so he said, I am going to bless Manasseh. He'll get a blessing, but the hand of the Lord will be upon Ephraim and he shall be a great nation. And I wondered in my mind when I heard it and when I thought about it, it sounded so familiar. It made me think that I had read this someplace before. When I was reading it, it almost caused me to think I was having a deja vu moment because I remembered that when Jacob was born, he too was in a fight for the birthright. He too was not in line for promotion. He too was not destined to be in the place. And maybe when the old man looks at his grandsons, he remembers him and Esau wrestling in the womb, fighting for the birthright and how he had to stir things up and get out of order to get the blessing because the blessing was not supposed to come upon him. But what God has for you, it is, it is, it is for you. Maybe the old man saw something of himself in his grandson and said, you can't push this one and leave that one behind. Maybe he identified with Ephraim because Jacob had been Ephraim. He had been the son least likely to receive the blessing, and yet he had fought to get his. And he says, I'm going to make it easier on you than it was for me. You won't have to fight in the womb, and you won't have to struggle all your life, and you won't have to cook so a portion of soup 
believe and sell a birthright in order to get into place and make all the mistakes I made, I'm going to straighten it out by getting out of order. I'm going to, you didn't hear that. I'm going to straighten it out by getting out of order. And so he took his hand and he laid his right hand on the head of the younger son and he blessed him. And he put his left hand upon the older brother and he blessed him. And Joseph was upset, but he couldn't do anything about it. And I wondered in my own mind, let's switch from Jacob and talk to Joseph for a minute. Joseph, how in the world could you as a little boy see down through time and see that the time was going to come that you would be the prince of Egypt and all your brothers would have to bow to you? You could see that good. You could see how to survive. Even though they threw you in a pit, you saw how to survive. They put you in Potiphar's house and you ran all of Potiphar's house without any experience or any background. You went into prison and began, began to run the prison and you could see all of that. You could see visions that loosed the baker and the butler and brought them out and brought them back to Egypt. You could see so good that you restored the economy of the entire nation of Egypt and you still can't see your sons. A warning, a warning, a warning to all fathers. Just because you see this doesn't mean that you see that. You could be good at seeing everything except your own son. It could be possible that you're better at seeing the world than you are seeing your own son. And Joseph, you've been right about everything else, but you are wrong about this. You brought everything to order in Potiphar's house. You brought everything to order in the prison. You brought everything to order in Egypt, but you did not allow for the grace factor that sometimes in order to bless you, God has to get out of order. And so he breaks the order and he shatters the type and he starts a new beginning by getting out of order. And he lays his hand, his right hand on Ephraim and his left hand on Manasseh. And he declares a blessing. His right hand on Ephraim, his left hand on Manasseh. And he declares a blessing on the son that shouldn't have got it. He released a blessing, his right hand on Ephraim and his left hand on Manasseh. And he declared a blessing, his right hand on Ephraim and his left hand on Manasseh. And he declared, wait a minute. When I took my right hand on Ephraim and my left hand on Manasseh, I can't do that without crossing my hands. Oh my God. All of a sudden I realized this text is not just a story about a family struggling to get their lives together. This is a, a preview of a coming attraction. Uh, this is not the end. This is the beginning that God has given us a sneak peek at the cross. For when Jesus went to the cross, God crossed his hands. The cross is God crossing his hands to bless the unblessable, to break the curse, to start a new order, to bring about deliverance. That's why Jesus could not die on the whipping post. You will remember that when Jesus was on the whipping post, they beat him with the cat of nine tails. History says that most people died on the whipping post, but if Jesus would have died on the whipping post, the Gentiles would have never been restored. He had to go to a cross because Jesus was God crossing his hands to get the one that wouldn't have gotten it. God is getting ready to cross his, God is getting ready to, God is, God is getting ready to cross his hands to get you the blessing. I know somebody else is in line for it, but God is getting ready to cross his hands to get you the blessing. God is getting ready to cross his hands to get you the blessing. God is getting ready to cross his hands. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I'm talking to somebody. I know it doesn't look like you're in line for the blessing. I know it doesn't look like you're next for the blessing. I know it doesn't look like the people want you to have it. I know you have never been preferred all of your life, but according to the cross, <laughs> the cross 
declares that God is going to take the tail and make him the head. The cross declares that God is getting ready to break the order. The cross declares that the Gentiles will be saved. The cross declares that the enemy will not get the victory today. The cross declares, somebody clap your hands and praise the Lord. You must understand then, my brothers and my sisters, that God will get the blessing to you. Whatever it takes to bless you, he will get the blessing to you. If he has to mix things up, if he has to cross things, if he has to go through yokes, if he has to reach over people, when God gets ready to bless you, he'll cross over them to get you the blessing. Hallelujah. I want the devil to know you thought you had plans, but God crossed them out. You thought I was going to die, but God crossed them out. You thought I'd never make it, but God crossed it out. You tried to destroy me, but God crossed it out. You messed up my childhood, but God crossed it out. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. The anointing of God is in this room. God is getting ready to cross it out. I don't care what the psychologist said. I don't care what the psychiatrist said. I don't care you're supposed to have a nervous breakdown, but the devil is the lie. God is going to cross it out. Get ready for the cross. Get ready for the cross. Get ready for... God will break every order. Break every system, break every chain, break every yoke, break every barrier, break every situation. When God gets ready to bless you, you don't have to be the preferred son. You can be the foolish son. You could have made mistakes. You could have spent your substance in riotous living. You could have laid with whores and prostitutes. You could have eaten with the swine at the hog pen. But when God gets ready to bless you, you may not even be the elder brother, but God will cross his hands and kill the fatted calf. God will cross his hands and put a ring on your finger. God will cross his hands and throw you a party. I feel a praise about to break out in this place. Cross it up, Jesus. Cross it up, Jesus. Cross it up, Jesus. Cross it up, Lord. In my finances, cross it up. Yes, Lord! God is getting ready to cross it up. God is getting ready to cross it up. God is getting ready to cross it up. I know it's been unjust. I know it's been unfair. I know you've been mistreated. But God is getting ready to get out of order. He's going to step over somebody. He's going to step around somebody. God is getting ready to get out of order. He's going to come over there where you are. And he laid his hands, his left hand on Manasseh and his right hand on Ephraim. And he crossed his hands to bless us. You might have done a whole lot of things wrong. And by all rights and order, you shouldn't even have a blessing. You've come short of the glory of God. And you've got secrets that still bring sadness to your soul. But there are some people that can tell you right now that in order for them to be where they are, God had to cross his hands. God crossed his hands. And you got the blessing. God crossed his hands and the door was opened up to you. God crossed his hands and you didn't have a nervous breakdown. God crossed his hands and you survived where other folk fell down. God crossed his hands and let you buy your own house. God crossed his hands and brought you through school. God crossed his hands and called you to preach the gospel. 
know you don't deserve it. You know the only way you did it. It was a stretch, but God did it. It was a stretch, but God did it. It was a stretch, but God did it. And you ought not be mad at your haters. You ought not be mad at them. They got a right to be upset because by all rights, it should have never been you. But they didn't know that every now and then, God will get out of order as I get ready to close. I want to stop by and get a testimony from a woman because I've been talking about all these men. But I think I'll get me a woman. There was a woman in the Bible days that had an issue of blood. And according to the law, she was not supposed to touch a priest. But one day, she heard Jesus was passing by. It was out of order for her to touch him. It was against scripture for her to connect with him. But she knew that every now and then, God would get out of order. He wasn't coming in her direction. He wasn't even looking her way. He was headed for some other woman's house. But she said, I heard that every now and then you cross your hands. I'm not the daughter of Jairus, but cross your hands. And she touched the hem of his garment. It was a stretch, but she touched the untouchable. It was a stretch, but she broke the law to get the healing. It was a stretch, but God did it. Jesus said. Who touched me? Who touched me? She came out. It was me. The reason she's so timid is because it was out of order. The reason she comes up, it was me. He asked who touched me. The disciples had time to say, have an entire discussion before she came up out of the crowd and said it was me. And the reason it was hard for her to come through the crowd is because for her to touch Jesus was out of order. Her touching Jesus should have made Jesus unclean. But instead of making Jesus unclean, her touching Jesus got her clean. And God had to stretch. Do you need him to stretch? Ow! Do you need him to stretch for you today? Have you fallen down into something that you need a stretch? It's a stretch. Have you gotten tied up in some filthy thing that according to the law, you ought to be cursed? God said, I will get out of order if you'll get out of the way. If you'll humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, I'll cross my hands to bless you. I'll meet you halfway. I'll come where you are. I'll let you touch me. I know you're dirty. I'll let you touch me. How? I'll let you touch me. Whosoever will, let him come. She said, it's I, it's me. Joseph said to his father, daddy, you wrong. Manessa should get this blessing. Jacob said, I know what I'm doing. I have been Ephraim. I have been the son least likely. And I'm not going to leave him here under a generational curse of never quite being good enough. I want to talk to people who have never quite been good enough. You always a runner up, sucking fiddle, number two, left behind. Well, I got good news. God's getting out of order. And he's going to get people that everybody looked over and cross his hands to bless you. And if you can receive that in your heart and in your spirit, it ought to make your chest stand up. It ought to make you hold your head up high. 
it ought to bring courage back to you. Not because you're so much. You ain't nothing. I ain't nothing. But because he's so much. He crossed his hands to give you another chance. The God who spends chapter after chapter after chapter, thousands of years teaching us order, got out of order to bless us, got out of order to redeem the church, got out of order to open up the door to the Gentiles, got out of order to heal a Samaritan, got out of order to deliver a Canaanite child, got out of order because every now and then God gets out of order to give you what you need. Now, you might not have been set up by your father and he might not have aimed you the way he should have aimed you and he might not have preferred you or he might not have been there at all. But God said, I'm going to cross my hands. There's a cross over your head right now. There's a cross over your head. And the cross is a promise that the law will not exempt you from the grace of God. In fact, it will qualify you for the grace of God. The grace opens up a door for rejects and failures to access the promise that what the law could not do in that it was the weak through the flesh God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And he did it all on a cross. And that's why Israel crossed his hands. I want to talk to people who have always felt like not enough. Who have always felt like runner-up. Who have always felt like, I'm not the one. I'm not the one. I'm good, but I'm not the one. Why does everybody else get the blessing and never me? This is your Sunday to receive a word from God. God is crossing his hands to bless you. God is crossing his hands to bless you. You know how kids are, can't you imagine? Ephraim, little Ephraim walking away from there. He got something. He don't even know what it is yet, but he, he got something. <laughs> you don't even know what you got yet, but you, you got something. You got something that you wasn't even supposed to get. But God got out of order and crossed his hands to give you a chance that man would have never given you their shot. If you don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. If don't nobody else praise him, you ought to praise him. You know you are walking in the favor of God. You know you're not supposed to be where you are right now. God crossed his hand. And don't you stand there with your lips glued together and not praise him. If don't nobody else praise him, every Ephraim got to open your mouth and holler before God. Because you know, God, God, I wasn't supposed to be here. I could have been in jail. I could have been locked up. I could have died. I could have died of AIDS. I could have lost my mind. I could have had a nerve. I wasn't supposed to be here. I know I wasn't supposed. But God! God crossed. God. Oh God. I got.
got to praise him. I got to praise him because I'm under a cross. I'm living up under a cross. I'm driving up under a cross. I'm working up under a cross. I'm building up under a cross. I'm growing up under a cross. I'm surviving up under a cross. A cross against COVID, a cross against cancer, a cross against disease, a cross against kidney failure. I'm living up under, I'm living up under, I'm living up under, I'm living up under, I'm living, I'm living, I'm living, I'm living, I'm living up, I'm living up under. Tell every demon, tell every witch, I'm living up under, living up under, living up under, I'm living up under, I'm living, I'm living up. Yes! God did it for me. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. If he did it for me, he will do it for you. It ain't every day. <laughs> it ain't an everyday thing. But every now and then, God gets out of order. And takes you places you never dreamed of. Unless you do stuff you never imagined possible. Do you know how many little ass you need, little boys, little girls would love to be you? And out of all the people all over the world, God crossed his hands. And if you ain't going to be grateful, shame on you. If every Ephraim out there don't tear up a rug praising God right now, shame on you. God got out of order to bless you. It was a stretch. But he blessed you. And you got to forgive your haters. Because they're supposed to dislike you. Yeah. They're supposed to dislike you. They're supposed to talk about you. Because God got out of order to bless you. And they feel just like the older brother did who didn't want to go into the younger brother's party. He was jealous. His old man had crossed his hands. What God has you in right now is crossed hands. Out of order. You're the only one in your family. You're the only one in your community. You're the only one that came out of your school, came out of your background. Check the friends you went to school with. Now you're going to get cute and not praise him. Lift your hands and open your mouth. Up! Open your mouth up to God. You didn't have to do this for me. But you did. You did. You did. Yes. 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 <laughs> this little simple prayer. Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. I accept you as Lord in my life. Come into my heart. Fill me with your glory. I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer with me, pick up the phone, call our prayer lines. Let somebody know. Testify about it. 
go in the comment section and tell somebody, I just gave my life to Jesus. Gave my heart to the Lord. I'm a backslider. I just came back to the Lord. I've been on a spiritual sabbatical. I'm back. I'm back. I lost my mind for a while and thought, thought I was so such and much, and now I realize that God got out of order to bless me. And I owe him some praise. And if you get that much out of this Sunday, then it's been a pretty good Sunday. It's a good Sunday. May the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Ghost rest, rule, and abide. Now don't you, don't, 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 don't you walk out of here in fear with that cross over your head. Don't you walk in doubt. Every time the enemy threatens you, just throw this up at him. I feel a change. You feel it? Let me hear from you. Let me hear from you. Go on Instagram, let me hear from you. Get on Facebook, let me hear from you. Send me a note, send me a message. Let me touch and agree with you that you can stay up under these crossed hands of the Father who wouldn't die till he stretched for Ephraim and gave him what he wasn't in line to get. That's you. That's you. You. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that is you. God bless you.